Welcome back to the swamp, my friends. It's good to see you made it back for another letter from our alleged cryptid hunter friend, Sam White Owl. He sent me this letter a couple of weeks ago, but I have not unfortunately had the time to read it. So I am backed up. He has sent me the next one after this, so expect to see that one soon. Sam once again sent me an excerpt just before this letter. He says, Hey Swamp, how are you? I see you've been busy posting videos in the past few days. Again, I really appreciate all of your work with both my stories and everyone else's. I think it's had a really positive effect on me to be able to share my experiences with you and your viewers. You also picked a beautiful barn owl picture for the most recent video, which is the owl I'm named after. Good work. This letter is a pretty long one, so hopefully you're ready to read and ready to pronounce some new cryptid names in the Q&A section. This is probably as long as it'll get though, so don't worry. Again, feel free to give me any suggestions or recommendations you might have. Otherwise, enjoy the letter. Before we get into this letter from Sam White Owl, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future video, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. Now, let's get into Sam White Owl's latest letter, all about Wendigo and the Deer People. Hey there everyone, it's Sam again. I hope you guys are enjoying the longer letters. I know I can get wordy sometimes, but since you guys still seem to be interested, I'll keep them coming. A quick life and family update. I have a nephew who I trained as a hunter. I also hijacked his email to send those letters. He's been working some cases overseas, and he's coming back home soon. I'll make sure I'll catch him up with everything in the coming weeks, so if he has any interesting stories, maybe I can tell you some of those. In the meantime, I'll answer some quick questions as usual before jumping into the cryptid for this letter. I've been trying to address your questions as best as I can. Sometimes I just don't see your comments until after I've already finished writing a letter so it may take a few letters to get to certain questions. Hopefully I'm doing okay on that front. So anyway, here we go. As always, feel free to skip ahead if you're not interested in the short Q&A section. Are Dogman vulnerable to silver? I'm not sure actually. Unlike with werewolves, I've never tried using silver on wolfmen. However, if my theory on their origins is correct, then I guess silver would be effective on them. But, as you may have seen in my dog man focus letter, you don't need silver to bring these guys down. I can definitely look into this more though. Maybe I can dig something up from Hunter's records or something. But, so far, I haven't seen anything that indicates any particular vulnerability of wolfmen to silver. How did my family get involved with monster hunting? Well, I wish there was an elaborate origin myth, like some superhero story, but really there's not. I think our family has just been dealing with cryptids for generations, trying to help people and monsters coexist in peace. In our community, we were the ones who people came to when there were problems with things like Sasquatches or Dogmen. Then at some point, we got the attention of the hunters, and we joined the organization. The first record I can find of a family member of mine in The Hunters comes from 1753. Apparently, he was a man named Matthew Drum, but that's about all I know, honestly. I got a couple of questions about the magazine fed Taurus, so I'll try to explain it better. My gun is a custom built weapon, not officially manufactured. I won't give the names of the people who made it, since they are very closely involved with the hunters and they'd rather remain anonymous. But they make great and often unusual weapons that are specifically designed for hunters. The gun I am talking about uses several major parts that have designs based on the Taurus Raging Hunter. They're not exactly the same as the Taurus parts, but they're based on them. These are mainly the barrel and sight, trigger and trigger guard, and a bit of the hammer. The frame, action, and grip, however, are designed very differently mainly because they accept a magazine rather than a cylinder. These parts are balanced out to work with all the others. This gun was made for me because I really like the feel of shooting the Raging Hunter, but I prefer a magazine over a speedloader. 
and I'd need to have one of those two things since, on hunts, there's not always time to reload each chamber of a revolver individually. So, anyway, it's not really a magazine-fed revolver. It's more of a combination of custom parts. It's pretty unnecessary, and maybe even illegal, but the result is worth it. Also, just for your knowledge, mag-fed revolvers apparently do exist, but they're very rare and very strange things. Anyway, that was a lot, but hopefully it clears up some things a bit. On to the more important things. Can I confirm any creepypasta monsters? I honestly didn't actually know what a creepypasta was until I saw some comments on Swamp Dweller's videos talking about it. Having looked into it a little more, most of it I've seen as fictional, but some things could be genuine. For example, the rake monster is most certainly a crawler, ash man, or pale man. Other monsters like the slender man are most definitely fictional. I've also never heard of a Kaza trap, so that's probably fictional as well. Some people express the idea that there are no reservations in Oklahoma. Not only is this false, the Supreme Court just ruled that about half of Oklahoma is actually reservation land, but also it's wrong because of something that happened in 1997. At the time, the term Indian Reservation was redefined to include all former reservations in Oklahoma. You can look this up, but in any case, people from the Cherokee Nation where I come from have been saying that our land is really a reservation for a long time, even though it was considered a tribal jurisdictional area or whatever. My family has been saying that it's actually a reservation for as long as I can remember. Anyway, I'm not going to get too hung up on the wording of things. The Cherokee Nation in almost half of Oklahoma is in fact a reservation, so that's what we should be calling it. More importantly, do cryptids take huge poops? <laughs> Honestly, yes, a lot of them do. The bigger the monster, the bigger the poop. Everyone poops after all. Let's respond to some of the people who commented from outside the United States. This time around, I saw lots of comments asking from creatures overseas, so I'm sorry if I don't get to yours. This time I'll address the comments from Japan, Brazil, Russia, and Eastern Europe. As usual, all of these places certainly do have monsters and active hunter communities. Japan in particular is home to a lot of strange and terrifying creatures. I'll go over a few of these. Maybe the most well known would be the Kappa, which are small amphibious humanoids with beaks and turtle-like shells. They're rather mischievous more than anything and so they aren't particularly dangerous. Also mischievous are the multi-tailed foxes known as the Kitsune, also called Hulijing in China. These rare and intelligent creatures appear to have some shape-shifting abilities, but they're not inherently malevolent like skimwalkers. More dangerous cryptids include things like Tsushigumo, which are giant spiders that are becoming increasingly rare. There's also a variety of ghostly cryptids throughout Japan, such as Yuki Ona, aka the Snow Woman. There are countless other monsters that inhabit the country, but those are just a few. Like other places in the world, many of these Japanese creatures are becoming rarer and rarer as cities expand. Brazil similarly has lots of cryptids. Although the hunter community there has grown a bit smaller in the past few years, like any other country, most of the monsters in Brazil inhabit rural and wilderness areas. The Amazon rainforest has been home to many of these. You may have heard of the Mapinguari, which is a giant humanoid that might be related to the North American Sasquatch. There's also the Kaipora, which are a group of small human-like creatures who play tricks on people in the jungle. They do indeed ride on rainforest pigs, which are called Pacaris. A few enormous serpent cryptids also make their home in Brazil, the largest of them being the aquatic Boyuna, and Yara are mermaid-like creatures who live in the rivers of Brazil as well. Last, I'll talk about Russia and Eastern Europe. These places share some creatures in common. The most famous would be the vampire, which originated in Eastern Europe, probably in Hungary or Romania, but we're not too sure. As I mentioned in an earlier letter, vampires are essentially humans with increased physical capabilities who need to consume blood to survive. They can influence people, but it's not quite mind control. They also have unnaturally long lifespans, 
but there's nothing particularly crazy about them. Then there's a variety of giant humanoids, who are probably related to Sasquatches. They live in the mountains, especially in Siberia and northern Russia. Mostly, they seem to be very closely related to each other, although they have a lot of different names. Almas, Abanayu are two common names for these Sasquatch relatives. Because of the hostile northern environment where they live, they're very difficult to study. Werewolves are common across Europe as well. There are also a few human-like forest-dwelling cryptids in Eastern Europe. These resemble the modern stereotypical fairy or elf. They have many names such as Via or Samodiva, although they don't have all the magical powers that they do in the myths, they are very elusive and very hard to study. And there are a variety of reptilian monsters in Eastern Europe as well, mainly dwelling in the mountains and seas. There are too many to name individually, but they include the Allah and the Albanian Koshedra. Both of these are large and winged serpent-like creatures that can grow multiple heads and influence the weather. You might even call them dragons. Anyway, I think that'll be it for Q&A this time. I hope that this wasn't too long and that I've covered some of what you guys wanted to know. It's a tough balance between answering your questions and keeping the Q&A short, but I'm trying. If you have any feedback, please let me know in the comments. Now, let's get into the monster for this letter. Actually, two monsters. I've gotten a lot of comments asking for information on these creatures, and they often get mixed up in the modern day so I'd like to help clear up some of that. So for this letter, we'll be talking about Wendigo and Deer People. Because I'll be going into detail on both of them, this is going to be a very long letter. So fasten your seatbelts and maybe get a snack or a drink. I'm going to warn you ahead of time that much of what I'm going to say might sound unbelievable. Similar to Skimwalkers, Wendigo and Deer People are two creatures that might simply sound too strange to be real. However, I can assure you that they absolutely do exist and are responsible for many deaths and disappearances across US and Canada. Maybe these creatures are magical somehow, or perhaps nature is just weirder than you might think. Either way, I've said before that my goal isn't to convince you guys of anything, it's mainly to share my experience and inform you what's out there. If you don't believe me, that's fine, but please don't put yourselves or others in danger just because you doubt me. Anyway, let's start with Wendigo. Although some people say Wendigos, I prefer the plural without the S at the end, and I think most other hunters do too. The original plural is actually Wendigoog, or Wendikook. The name Wendigo can also be spelled a ton of different ways, including Windigo or Ouijigo. Anyway, that's enough linguistic stuff. What exactly is a Wendigo? Wendigo comes from the myths and legends of the various Algonquin-speaking tribes who live in eastern and central Canada and parts of the northern United States. As you may know, these areas are prone to long, harsh winters. Before modern electricity or heating, winter was an even more dangerous and rough time. Of course, you can't really farm during the winter since there's not much that can grow. The game also becomes scarcer and harder to find in the winter, so hunting and fishing and gathering aren't as easy or as profitable. People had to store food to get through the cold months. Sometimes though, this food ran out and there was a famine, and people had nothing to eat. Some starved, and others resorted to the worst actions imaginable. Cannibalism. They ate the flesh of their fellow human beings, and this transformed them. They became monsters. This is how human beings first became Wendigo. I know this sounds like a fairy tale or folklore, but considering that Wendigo themselves are very much real, I'm more than inclined to believe it. Wendigo is actually about 8 feet in height, but they can sometimes be as tall as 12 feet. Essentially, they look like enormous walking corpses. They are extremely skinny and lean, with an emaciated, gaunt, skeletal appearance. You can see their bones sticking out from beneath their skin. Their skin is an ashy gray color, and their eye sockets are sunken, like dark pits. 
Their eyes themselves glow white or yellow. They don't really have noses or lips, so their teeth are constantly visible, stretching almost from ear to ear. These teeth are often unnaturally sharp, but their general structure mirrors the teeth of what a humans once were. They also have long, dark hair, which often falls over their backs and shoulders like a mane. Overall, Wendigo looks similar to crawlers, ash men, pale men, only much larger and possessing hair and darker skin. Wendigo is also much stronger. As I said in a previous letter, Wendigo doesn't have antlers or deer skulls. That whole idea is pretty much a modern thing because traditional native accounts don't mention any antlers. But later on in this letter, we'll talk about deer people which often get mixed up with the Wendigo and which can actually have antlers and deer skulls sometimes. In the old times, cannibalism was not really common and it happens even less nowadays. However, humans can become Wendigo by being exposed to them for too long. This process seems to require several days but eventually, if a human stays in close proximity to a Wendigo, for that time, they become one themselves. Wendigo doesn't breed or reproduce in the usual way, thankfully. So cannibalism and staying near a Wendigo for too long are the only known ways for new Wendigo to arise. That's why they're so rare. Some myths say that greedy people become Wendigo, but that just isn't true, as far as we know anyway. Cannibalism alone also doesn't transform people into a Wendigo, not by itself. There are also additional circumstances that are necessary, but these are still unknown entirely. Maybe it has something to do with the cold or the geographical area. Maybe it's magic. Who knows? What I do know is that the worst thing about a Wendigo is their lifestyle. They are constantly starving. No matter how much they consume, they will always be hungry. They simultaneously represent greed and starvation, gluttony and famine. They don't think like humans either. The unstoppable need to devour flesh and meat is essentially the only thing they know. They prefer human flesh but they will eat anything that moves. Because they're never satisfied and never rest, Wendigo can devastate ecosystems, eating through everything in an area before moving on and repeating the process. They will actively target and hunt down humans as well, which makes them incredibly dangerous to us. Usually, they'll just eat humans, but in some cases, they will take them alive back to a lair or den. There, they will either force feed the captive human flesh, or simply stay near them for days, and this result is the creation of a new Wendigo. Because of the danger they present to humans and ecosystems, the hunters have to kill on sight. They're one of the relatively few monsters that have that rule applied to them. There is no capturing or studying these creatures, they simply need to be put down. And although I often feel bad about that, I've realized that the life of a Wendigo must be hell. Can you imagine? Starving. All the time and no way to relieve it. No matter how much you eat, you will never, ever be able to stop your pain and your suffering. The horror and agony of living like that must be unimaginable. In a way, killing a Wendigo is mercy. Granting that mercy is very difficult though. Wendigo may be skinny but they are incredibly physically strong. They usually move in a staggering walk, but when they sense prey, they move unnaturally fast to catch it. Despite their large size, they are also surprisingly stealthy, and this allows them to ambush prey. Wendigo also have the disturbing ability to mimic human voices. Upon hearing certain sounds like voices, they can easily replicate them, like lyrebirds or parrots. Although this mimicry can be very convincing, the Wendigo is usually unable to speak anything more than a few words at a time. They can respond to humans, but they can't really hold conversations or answer complex questions. For instance, usually Wendigo uses their mimicry ability to replicate a call for help, luring unsuspecting victims into a favorable ambush spot. Wendigo is tough and sly, but they can be killed. Normal bullets will hurt them, but slashing melee weapons are usually the best choice to deal damage with. The best option, 
however, is fire. Because of their nature as monsters of the cold and ice, flames are effective against a wendigo. Incendiary rounds, a lot of cocktails, and even simple torches or burning sticks can do a lot of damage against a wendigo. They have limited ability to regenerate from wounds, so it's important to kill them quickly. The weak spot of a wendigo is the chest, as destroying their ice-cold hearts will kill them instantly. After bringing down a wendigo, it's also best to burn the body, usually after cutting it into pieces. That will ensure they don't regenerate. It sounds unbelievable, I know. But there is a reason why the old myths were created anyway. In the case of the Wendigo, they mostly tell the truth. My first experience with these monsters was in 2001. That year, Eastern Canada had an unusually long and tense winter. With lots of snow and ice build up, while some people took the opportunity to go skiing or snowboarding, others decided to explore the wilderness. I'm sure I don't have to tell you that this was a bad idea, and for some people it ultimately proved fatal. You need to be careful when going out into the woods at any time, but especially in the winter. These people didn't take the proper precautions, and they paid for it with their lives. Sergio called me offering me a job. Capital H Hunters in Quebec had been turning up remains of several missing people in the wilderness. All that was left were skeletons and scattered bones. Some of the skeletons were only a few hours old when they had been discovered though, indicating that whatever had killed them had eaten them on the spot. Based on teeth marks on some of the bones, it looked like at least one Wendigo was involved. The Quebec Hunter branch had put out a request for assistance to any available hunters in the area. At the time, I was nearby and had just finished a Sasquatch relocation, so I answered the call. The hunters needed my help. A few days later I was in eastern Quebec, with two other hunters. One was a Canadian named Katie, and the other was a fellow American named Zach. Katie was a brown-haired and tall lady in her mid-thirties. She had first discovered some of the Wendigo kills. Zach was around my age, maybe a little younger. He was a bulky black-haired man who favored a shotgun. We started our investigation by going to the spot of the most recent Wendigo victim. We were lucky. It hadn't snowed since this victim was discovered. Of course, all that remained were bones and clothing, but those could still give us some information. The skeleton and clothes were in pieces strewn across the snow in a small clearing. The Wendigo had evidently ripped off the victim's clothes before beginning to eat. Much of the snow and dirt was still red where the blood had soaked into it. The body had been thoroughly scavenged by animals after death but I doubted that much of the meat had remained on it after that. From what I'd read, Wendigo was very thorough eaters. The teeth marks looked almost human, I remember Zack had said as he examined a long piece of the bone, part of either an arm or a leg if I had to guess. That's because Wendigo was human at one point, Katie said. I nodded and went over to peer at the same bone that Zack was looking at. He was right. It looked like a human with sharper teeth than normal had bitten down into the bone, leaving a clear semicircle of tooth marks. One of the victim's arms had pulled off and was flung to the side, and their jacket and shirt had been torn open, but there was no evidence of the exact blow that had killed them. I felt terrible for whoever this was. They had probably died in awful pain. We couldn't even tell their gender. Although, based on the clothing, they were probably male. After we dealt with the Wendigo, we called in the police and have them deal with everything. It's not our job to clean up or notify the relatives of the deceased. Katie assured me that the Quebec police would let us do what we had to without asking any questions. It's the same for most other law enforcement groups. I'm not sure, but I think the higher-ups of the hunters have some sort of agreement with them, even though we don't work together. In any case, it makes our work as hunters much, much easier. There were some footprints scattered around the clearing as well. It looked like the victim had been running when they had been grabbed by the Wendigo. 
Wendigo footprints simply look like abnormally large human tracks, barefoot of course. Some of these led into the clearing alongside the victim's boot prints. The footprints in the clearing were a mess, suggesting the victim had struggled for a bit before dying, and the Wendigo tracks along with the small blood trail exited the clearing. Heading east, I pointed to those footprints and we began to follow them. The trail was probably around two days old, but it was the best lead we had. I always wear a face mask when I'm operating in cold weather, and this time was no different. I also had on a lightweight, insulated jacket designed for mobility as well as warmth. I was glad for it, because it was freezing cold. Being the best tracker of the group, I took the lead for this part. The Wendigo's trail wasn't too terribly hard to follow, though, because of the snow. The terrain was mostly just spruce trees, dead moss, and bushes. I remember that I saw a few other animal trails as we walked. We ignored those, though, keeping our eyes on the Wendigo prints. Eventually, it began to get dark, so we made camp in a little hollow, aiming to pick up the trail in the morning. The night was silent except for the wind. The forest is often like this in the winter, but this time it was eerie. I knew that the Wendigo was out there somewhere, and that it could be very well biding its time and waiting for the chance to strike. The descriptions I'd heard of the Wendigo's appearance also started flooding back into my mind. I did not want to see something like that. I was able to fall asleep that night, but I remember having a horrible dream where I was being pursued by something through the trees, unable to run fast enough to get away. In the dream, I knew I was being chased by the Wendigo but I just could not match its speed. I turned around and saw its dead face rushing at me, leaping on top of me. I woke up sweating and afraid, but I was able to calm down fairly quickly, telling myself that we were going to end this creature. The next day we woke up before dawn and continued to follow the trail. We did so until nearly evening. I was starting to think that we should make camp soon when we heard a sudden crashing of branches from somewhere ahead of us then a scream that echoed through the trees. It sounded like a deer crying out in pain. I realized, that's a rare and disturbing sound that you should never have to hear. Immediately, all three of us had our guns out and began heading towards the sound. It could have been any sort of predator really, but if we were lucky, it was the Wendigo. We came through the trees a few minutes later to find a dead white-tailed deer on the ground. Blood was splashed across the snow beneath it, and I could still smell the coppery scent of it in the air. This had just happened. The doe had been partially eaten, as it was missing chunks of flesh from its side and its flanks, and some of the internal organs were spilling out into the ground. There was no sign of the Wendigo, however. Eyes up! It's still out here somewhere, Kitty hissed to Zack and me. We all gripped our weapons and took a moment to look around and listen. The woods were silent again. Even the wind had let up for a second. The light was dying fast, so I knew we didn't have much time. We wouldn't be able to see this thing very soon. I suggested that we back out of there and make camp, and others agreed. Leaving behind the poor deer, we retreated a short distance away. We made sure to still have a good view of the trees near the deer, in case the Wendigo decided to come back to finish its meal. We lit our fire that night, and none of us spoke much. We were all on edge, watching the trees and the shadows. It wasn't terribly long before Katie said she heard something from beyond our campsite. I had been watching to see if the Wendigo would come back for the doe, and I hadn't heard anything. But Katie swore that she had, so we all strained our ears to listen over the crackling of the fire I could hear the snow crunching from out in the trees. Then I heard a weak, breaking voice call out, Help! Is that it? Zack asked Katie. We both agreed and nodded. Almost certainly, I whispered. Need... I... I, I need... Help! The voice came again. It was a perfect imitation of a woman's voice, and for the first time, I truly understood how people could fall for this trap. The voice sounded so weak and exhausted, 
exactly like a real human would. Even I actually felt like going to it, but I knew better. Instead, I used that impulse to pick up my rifle and double check that I loaded it with the custom made incendiary rounds I had brought. The voice grew in volume for the first few minutes, becoming more and more intense and harder and harder to resist. It kept repeating the same three words. I need help. Although it kept coming from the same direction, it seemed to be getting closer over time. But none of us could see anything in the darkness. Gradually, the voice began to distort, growing more strained and high-pitched, crying out the same words. There was another sound underneath the words now. Almost a scream. The words became unintelligible until there was just a single, long screeching through the trees. My eyes began watering, and I nearly soiled myself. It was one of the most terrifying sounds I had ever heard. Zack was clearly horrified too, but Katie remained solid as rock. Hey, it's alright. It's just pissed that we're not falling for his trap. Keep steady, Katie said to me and Zack. I realized that she must have been through this before. Her confidence made me feel a bit better, so I wiped my eyes and made an effort to steady myself. There was a long silence after the scream. I was tempted to push up to where the noise had come from, but I knew that the Wendigo was too smart for that. I wouldn't be here anymore if I had done that. Instead, I waited. Minutes went by and I actually started to relax a bit. I didn't let down my guard, but the fear I had been feeling before started to fade. Something right around then. There was a loud thud from behind me, and I jumped to the side instinctively. We were all whirled around to the source of the noise and found the dead, half-eaten deer from before. It had landed on our campfire, splashing blood and organs all across the place. I realized that it had been thrown, and that was when the Wendigo attacked. It came out from the shadows as we were all distracted by the deer, rushing at Zack first and it grabbed him with its clawed hands. Zack gave a cry of surprise and started to fire his shotgun. It was a 12 gauge loaded with dragon's breath ammo, so each shot sent out a roaring spray of flames. As impressive as the display was, Zack couldn't turn to get a good shot on the Wendigo, and the fire from his gun mostly missed the beast. Katie and I raised our rifles and began to fire, but it was too late. The Wendigo opened his jaw wide and bit through Zack's neck, practically biting his entire head off. I'd never seen somebody die like that, and for a moment, I stopped firing. But I snapped out of it when the Wendigo dropped Zack's still twitching body and turned to Katie and me. I'll never forget the sight. The monster's long black hair fell down around its two glowing white eyes sunken into the dark pits of their sockets. The lower half of its face was red with Zack's blood, and its lipless mouth displayed its teeth as it were constantly grinning. It only took an instant to take all of this in, and to this day, it is one of the most disturbing and horrifying sights I have ever seen. The sight shook me so much that I unfroze. I aimed for its chest and shot at it along with Katie. The thing lunged forward, starting a supernaturally fast charge and our bullets pounded into it. Counter mass. That didn't stop it though. It drew an arm back and swiped at Katie, making contact and sending her careening backward into the snow. The thing was on top of us now, so I dropped my rifle and pulled my pistol out, which was loaded with tracer rounds. As the Wendigo turned to me, I somehow managed to put a bullet into the side of its face. It gave that god-awful scream again, as the round caught fire and its head completely burst into flames. The tracer had done the trick, and the Wendigo flailed around screaming as it burned. It staggered away from me, moving back towards the trees, but I kept firing, this time aiming for its chest. The incendiary rifle rounds we'd hit it with before caught fire too, and the flames erupted in its chest. It thrashed round helplessly, and I remember being concerned that the trees around us might catch fire, but luckily none of them did, and it wasn't long before the monster collapsed to its knees, weakly reaching out as if to pull itself back up. 
I felt terrible for it as I watched it struggle, doing the same thing a human would. It was clearly an incredible pain, which must have ended a few moments later as it fell onto its stomach and lay still. It was dead. I stood there for a moment, watching the massive burning body of the cryptid that had once been human. Then I turned back to the campsite, remembering that Katie had been hit. I rushed over to where she had fallen and found her unconscious. Her stomach and chest had been raked by the Wendigo's claws, and blood stained her jacket. The wounds didn't really seem too deep, but she clearly still needed to get help as soon as possible. I rushed back to the tent and grabbed a medicine kit. Eventually, I managed to bind her injuries and stop the bleeding, and I decided to wait. I wasn't sure how to handle things. Moving Katie could make her injuries worse, but we couldn't just sit there forever. She needed medical attention. I decided that if she didn't regain consciousness by the morning, I'd have to do my best to carry her back out of the woods to civilization. I wouldn't be able to get her anywhere in the dark anyway. In the meantime, I waited until the Wendigo had stopped burning. Then I started to hack it apart with the metal combat tomahawk I had brought. Wendigo doesn't bleed, but there is still disgusting work to be had. After cutting what was left of the monster apart, I set fire to each of the pieces again to ensure that they were totally burned. While I was doing this, I was doing my best to keep myself together. Zack's body was still nearby, and my mind kept replaying the moment that Wendigo had bitten into his neck. It had been so sudden and unexpected, and I had been right there, unable to stop it. I had seen people die before, and I had seen people already dead, but this had been the most shocking and quick thing I've ever seen. But Zack knew the risk of being a hunter, as much of any of us do. I had barely gotten to know him, so I can't say much about him, but I will never forget him. Katie woke up later on that night. She said she would be okay on her own while we went back to town to get help. So I left there and made my way out of the forest as fast as I could, not stopping until I got access to a phone. I called a hunter crew to recover Katie and to clean up what was left of the Wendigo. Katie made a full recovery, and from what she told me later, the Wendigo had burned to ash by the time she was picked up. Neither of us knows what happened to Zack's body, but I'm assuming it was sent back to any family he might have. I hope that he got back to them if he had them. So, that was one of the most intense experiences, hunting cryptids, that I have ever had. But I survived it somehow, and emerged unharmed. If you learn anything from that story, it should be just to use common sense when you're thinking about going into the woods, and don't go out there in bad weather, you might not like what you find. Now, this letter is already getting incredibly long, so let's wrap it up by talking about the deer people. These cryptids are often confused with Wendigo, but they're actually quite different. Deer people can live anywhere that deer do but they're mainly found in northern areas. I don't know where the deer people came from, but I would guess that they were probably just regular deer ones. Deer people are shapeshifters, and although I've never actually seen them change form for myself, I know that they can take on different forms. The females of the species are said to take on the form that very closely resembles a human woman, except for her feet, which will be deer feet. Or hooves, I should say. This is the deer woman or deer lady that is found in many native myths. This form is supposedly incredibly beautiful and alluring. In the myths, she represents fertility and bounty and is said to help a woman conceive. I don't know if that's all true, but I do know that there are other aspects of the legend that are real. Deer woman will lure young men into the woods and seduce them. If they fall for the trap, she will trample them to death. I've never seen a deer lady, but hunter accounts of them are pretty creepy, and the trampled corpses of young men in the woods would suggest that they are real. The deer people that I have seen usually take form of, well, a deer. Usually they appear as white-tailed or mule deer. However, something about these animals may be off. They may stand or move strangely, or have an unsettling energy around them. They also stand upright and walk on their hind legs, and when startled or angered, they can scream in a very human-like way. 
in this form, deer people are unnerving, but they are not terribly dangerous or aggressive. Normally, they seem to just die like normal animals or cryptids, passing away from old age or natural causes. But there are rare cases where, for some unknown reason, deer people will live on for much longer than their normal lifespan. As they age, like this, deer people can become bitter, in even what you might call evil. Their flesh will start to decay and fall away, and their bodies will warp and twist. They will start to grow and become gradually more human-like. Their front feet will become clawed hands, and they will begin to stand only on their hind legs. The skin on their faces usually decays before the other parts of their body, leaving behind only the deer skull as a head. When deer people transform like this, hunters simply call them tall deer, since they grow anywhere from 8 to 15 feet tall. These aged, half-dead creatures begin to crave flesh and will eat any type of meat, including that of humans. This is probably one of the main reasons why people often get tall deer confused with Wendigo, but they aren't the same thing. Wendigo was once fully human, and deer people were once probably deer, but when deer people become tall deer, they gain the same carnivorous hunger as a Wendigo. Thankfully, deer people do not always reach this point. In fact, it's rather rare for them to become tall deer. But it isn't known exactly why this change occurs. So, it could be the case that any given deer person could become a humanoid, meat-eating terror. While deer people in general don't have a kill-on-sight status, tall deer do. Like Wendigo, tall deer can ravage ecosystems and present a significant danger to human and animal populations. They don't have the voice mimicking or regeneration abilities of a Wendigo, but they do share the same supernatural strength and resilience. They are hard to fight and hard to kill, but I have done it before. I'll keep this last story shorter than the previous one. This one occurred in 2003, so only a bit after my winter with the Wendigo in Quebec. I'd become more accustomed to working alone since then, so when Sergio contacted me about an attack in Montana and told me that there were not other available hunters in the area, I was okay with that. Between tasks, us hunters do often have a lot of free time, but we can't be available 24-7. Sergio informed me of the details of the attack. The victim, who I won't name, was a young woman who lived in the state. She was still alive, but her left leg had been amputated when she had gone to the hospital. She had also been gored in the back and had lost an eye. Official reports said that it was a brown bear attack, but according to her medical notes, she had repeatedly insisted that she was injured by something with antlers. I have no idea how Sergio got those medical notes, but I wasn't going to complain. Sergio told me that I was likely going to be dealing with a tall deer, and I agreed. The first step was to head to Montana and talk to the victim. I tracked her down to a local hospital where she had been going for physical therapy. She would gotten a prosthetic leg and was learning how to walk with it. I waited until her session was over and then asked her if I could speak to her. I told her the name of my organization and explained what we were here to deal with. At first, she was very suspicious, as people almost always are, but as I assured her of my intent, she opened up. She got visibly upset and started to cry slightly as she told me her story, but she still gave me all the detail I could have asked for. She told me that she had been hiking with a group when she stepped off the trail to use the bathroom. She had been finishing up when she heard a noise from the trees nearby. She described it as a low creaking or groaning sound, like nothing she had ever heard before. She called out and got no response. When she turned around to head back to the group, there was a crashing through the trees behind her and then something had stabbed her in the back. She had been flung forwards, onto the ground, on her stomach. Rolling over, she would come face to face with an enormous, two-legged creature that had bone-white face, topped with two huge antlers. She screamed, and the creature had swatted her across the face with a huge hand, smashing the left side of her skull and blinding her in that eye. It had then grabbed her left leg with one hand and pressed down on it with the other, snapping her leg backward. At the sight of this, she had fallen unconscious. She had woken up in the hospital without her leg, surrounded by family and the friends she had been hiking with. 
Her friends told her they had heard her screams, and they had rushed over to find her finally knocked out. They had gotten help, and thankfully, she survived. Apparently, nobody had seen the tall deer but her. I guess that it must have ran off when her friends came approaching. I told her that she was very lucky she had brought her friends with her, otherwise I probably wouldn't have been talking to her at that moment. She told me where the incident had taken place, but because her group had been fairly far into the trail, it was hard for me to get an exact location. I asked if she would be willing to go back to the spot with me, but she refused. I think she was too afraid of the creature. I completely understood. Even telling her story had taken an immense amount of courage. She told me that maybe one of her other hiking members could take me there though. After she listed some of their contact information, I think turned headed to find one of her friends on her list, another young woman who I also won't name. She wasn't too hard to track down, and I found her at her house. After I told her who I was and explained that I just met her friend, she agreed to take me to the site of the incident. The next day, we headed out in the morning and arrived at the site of the attack before noon. The woman directed me to the general location where she and her group had found their friend lying unconscious. The exact spot was of course off the trail and the young woman refused to go there. She wouldn't leave the trail. I was grateful for this as it allowed me to do my work alone, without being watched. I left her on the trail and went to examine the site of the attack. Almost immediately I picked up signs of tall deer presence. It wasn't hard to find. The branches and limbs in one area had been snapped and pushed aside by the creature as it rushed at the girl, and many small ground plants had been flattened beneath its massive hooves. I found only one reasonably clear track in the mud. It was an enormous deer footprint, deep and wide. The sight of it was enough to send a genuine chill up my spine. The monster had to be gigantic. I took the young woman back home and returned to the trail in the evening. It was too late to start tracking the tall deer, but I decided to camp at the nearest spot that I could. In the morning, I woke up early and started following the trail of the tall deer. It was unexpectedly difficult to follow the huge beast because it left surprisingly little sign. The thing hadn't pushed over trees or torn up the ground as other creatures might have. Despite its size, it was leaving a few tracks. It was in the afternoon sometime when I found the first body, or what was left of it anyway. I came through the trees to find a tiny brook, and I might not have noticed a dead animal by the stream if there hadn't been a footprint next to it. I crouched down to examine the remains. It looked like a bobcat. It was hard to tell because there was not much left and it was gored so bad. All that remained were a few splatters of dry blood and some small chunks of bone and little pieces of tissue and hair. I couldn't be positive, but judging by the footprints it looked like the cat had been seized by the tall deer while it was drinking at the water. Bobcats are very wary animals, and I was surprised that the tall deer had been able to grab it before it ran away. I took a look around to see if I could find any hiding places where the monster may have hidden before attacking but there were no obvious places where it could have approached the brook unseen. Something wasn't adding up here, but I had to put it out of my mind for now. Maybe that had been an old or weak bobcat. Maybe it was hard of hearing and hadn't noticed the tall deer in time. Whatever the case was, the Montana woods had just suffered another casualty. I got up and continued to follow the tall deer's trail. After another hour or so, I lost the trail on some rocky ground. I took a guess where the tall deer might have gone, and after a few moments, I stepped out of the trees and onto a hiking trail. I paused, looking around. Had the monster really come this way? My heart skipped a beat as I realized what was going on. Hiking trails led to campsites, and for tall deer, campsites were a buffet. The monster was probably following the trail, waiting for unwary hikers. And if it didn't get anybody on the trail, then it could just attack a campsite. I mentally kicked myself for not picking up a map of the trails at the entrance to the area. I had to make a choice of which way to go. Which way would the tall deer have gone? It took a moment to look for more prints, but there were none on the trail. With no clues to go on, I just started walking, heading down the trail in a random direction and hoping that the tall deer had gone that way. 
My instincts turned out to be good. After less than an hour of walking, the trail led me straight to the campsite. It was a little more than a big clearing in the woods, but two tents already had been set up. Two women and a man, all middle-aged, sat around a burnt-out campfire, talking and laughing. When I came up to them, they all looked to be a bit shocked. Most people don't go hiking casually with rifles and a combat tomahawk, after all. I greeted them as nonchalantly as I could, even though I was trying to keep an eye on the trees. The tall deer didn't seem to like groups of people, but you could never be too safe. I asked the trio if they had seen anything unusual, and they said they hadn't. Sometime around then I got an idea. One of the group asked what I was doing and if I was a park ranger or going hunting. I was tempted to lie so I wouldn't give myself away, but I just said something along the lines of, I'm doing an investigation. I then showed them my badge and asked for their cooperation. They instantly agreed, probably scared and confused. I did my best to reassure them that it would be best if they just kept going about their business, but didn't leave the campsite. They said that they hadn't been planning on leaving until the next day, so I thanked them and went back off towards the trail. I had a plan. Hopefully, no other hikers would show up, and hopefully, the tall deer used its vision and its hearing more than its sense of smell. I looped around the campsite staying out of sight of the trio of campers. I found a small slope overlooking the campsite and decided to take up my position there. From here, I could see the campsite in the surrounding tree line, and hopefully the campers hadn't noticed me. It was getting towards evening, so I pulled out a power bar and ate while I did some journaling and waited. Thankfully, no other campers showed up for the rest of that day, and for that I was grateful. My plan was probably not going to work if there were too many people around. I was using these three campers as bait, essentially. I wasn't going to let them get hurt by any means, but I was hoping the tall deer would come to this campsite so that I could deal with it here. I had a feeling that the cryptid had come this way, and it would see the three campers as a potential meal, and when it showed itself, I would strike. It got dark eventually and the group lit up their fire again. They had a game of cards and cooked dinner, and then they ate and spent some more time talking. Soon, the man and one of the women went into one of the tents leaving the other woman by herself by the fire. Perfect. If the tall deer was going to strike, it would be soon. I took my rifle and waited, my eyes trained on the tree line around the campsite, and my ears perked for any hint of noise. After just a little while of waiting, the woman who remained by the fire stood up. She took a pail of water that she had nearby, and began to pour it onto the flames. The campfire hissed loudly as it was extinguished, the dark gray smoke rose into the air from the fire pit. It was nearly a full moon, so the light without the fire was still quite good. It was then I heard a low groaning sound, like a tree creaking in the wind, but with more bass to it and a slight unnatural echo. I couldn't place the sound, but it seemed like it had come from the opposite side of the campsite from me. The woman must have heard it too because she froze and looked around, clearly spooked. The noise came again, and this time, I was sure it was coming from the opposite side of the campsite. I raised my rifle and looked through the scope, peering through the moonlit darkness to where I knew the groaning was coming from. I couldn't see anything there except for the trees swaying slightly. Then I realized there was... something wrong. I knew why the bobcat had been caught off guard, and how the tall deer was able to move without being noticed. I wasn't looking only at trees. I was looking at two enormous trunk-like legs advancing through the forest. I lifted my scope to the full figure of the tall deer, 12 feet tall and slowly lumbering towards the campsite. As I took aim at the skull, I saw two pinpricks of red light flare to life in its hollow eye sockets. With no other warning, it began crashing forward straight at the campsite and the woman. I squeezed the trigger and readjusted my aim before squeezing again. The tall deer stopped mid-charge as I hit it, and the monster gave a vocalized roar that shook my chest and echoed through the night. The sound was horrible. Half-screaming deer, half-screaming man, and all fury. My shots had clearly hurt it, and had also stopped it from attacking the woman, who was frozen in place. The deer whipped its upper half around, searching for the source of the gunshots, and I took the opportunity to fire again, aiming for its antlered skull. 
I missed as the creature moved its head to look for me, and one horrifying second later, its hollow eyes found me. It gave another enraged bellow and came in my direction, taking massive strides through the campsite. I began to back up to keep distance between us, firing as I did, and although the creature flinched as I shot it repeatedly in the chest and neck, it didn't stop coming at any point. I desperately wanted to run as the enormous cryptic closed in on me, but I knew that I couldn't. I wouldn't be able to outrun it if I even tried, and I wasn't going to abandon these campers. The tall deer entered the tree line again, smashing through branches and trampling over smaller trees completely as it ran up the hill towards me. At some point, I felt my gun click empty, and instead of reloading, I tossed the rifle aside and drew my combat tomahawk. I nearly broke and ran as the tall deer reached me. It seemed even bigger up close. Instead, I put that energy and that impulse into repositioning myself, diving to the side as the monster raised one enormous hand over its head. I could hear the whooshing sound the tall deer swiping through the air right next to me. I turned and saw that I was right near one of the beast's tree-like legs. I swung out with one of my hands and I felt the tomahawk bite deep into the deer's leg, cutting through its dark fur and into the flesh beneath. The monster gave a low groan and dropped to one knee, supporting itself on its uninjured leg. I drew back my tomahawk and swung again, slashing into the same leg once more. No blood came from either of the wounds. I don't even think tall deer have any blood left in their bodies. I was about to move forward to hack at the creature's head, when it reached down and snatched at me with one enormous hand. I stepped backward, but his claws still raked across my back and chest, tearing my shirt open and leaving shallow cuts that immediately filled with blood. The tall deer turned to face me and swung its other hand, smacking me and knocking me. I hit the ground hard and felt something crack as the wind was knocked out of me. I was struggling for breath. I rolled aside as the tall deer balled its hands into fist and began pounding the earth to hit me. I managed to roll away from its strikes and came back up to crouching position. I remember thinking about Lewis's advice, realizing that I just had to hit this thing in the head. And to do that, I had to knock it down again. Staying low, I stepped towards the tall deer as it reached out to grab me. I just barely ducked beneath his claws and wound up between its legs. It was a perfect angle to hit it again, and I did just that, chopping into its already injured leg. The beast groaned again, unable to support itself. It collapsed backward onto its injured leg a second time. As it fell, its head sunk down, giving me another perfect opportunity to strike. I drew back my tomahawk and swung with all the strength I could muster, putting everything I had into a single blow. My weapon came down between the tall deer's antlers and cleaved into its skull, practically splitting it in two. The monster didn't even scream. It just groaned again, shaking the ground like an earthquake. It fell back into the ground completely and twitched a few times before falling still. Exhausted and relieved, I dropped to my knees beside it, panting and shaking. When I had recovered, I went back to the campsite and made sure that everyone was okay. The pair who had been in their tent had never left it, and the woman who had been attacked had retreated into hers. I told them that they should stay where they were, and everything was okay. They were safe. I asked them if they had a map, which they did. Using it, I was able to locate the nearest ranger station, which was surprisingly close. Leaving the campers behind, I turned on my headlamp and hiked down the dark trail to the station, every step hurting the side of my body. I was able to push through the pain, and I arrived at the station very quickly. There I was able to find a phone and got in contact with a hunter cleanup crew. I informed them of the situation, and the rest is history. I got my claw wounds treated at a nearby hospital, and although they left some nasty scars, they weren't too terribly bad. Worse was the fractured ribs and bruises that I had gotten from being swatted aside by the tall deer. Those took much longer to heal and I was out of commission for about a month while I recovered and then took some time to relax. Injuries like those are why I hate melee combat. Whenever possible, I try to kill things from afar. Most cryptids don't have ranged attack capabilities, 
so if you can take them down before they get close, you'll be okay. But close combat is where hunters get injured and die. I was lucky I'd only suffered a few injuries. Encounters with tall deer can be much, much worse. Anyway, that's about it for Wendigo and Deer People. I hope you learned something from my stories and the information I gave. I know these were two monsters that I got asked about a lot, so I wanted to talk about them in length. And hopefully, now you won't confuse them, because they're usually very different. Next time, we'll talk about something else. If you have any suggestions or questions, feel free to leave them in the comments and hopefully I'll see them. In the meantime, use your common sense, stay on the trail, bring a friend, and all that good stuff. You know by now, if you've been listening to my letters so far, just be safe in the woods, especially up north, and be safe in general during these crazy times. We'll talk soon. This has been Sam White Owl, signing out. Thank you for listening to the most recent letter from our friend and alleged cryptid hunter, Sam White Owl. If you enjoyed this story, please be sure to hit that like button as it helps me out a ton. The more likes this video gets, the more YouTube promotes it to fresh new eyes. If you're new to the swamp, why not join us? Hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications to never miss a new video, as I upload them almost every single day, and all things natural and supernatural. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future video, whether it's a cryptid hunting story or a different experience that you may have experienced yourself, be sure to send it in at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that help keep this channel going. If you're not aware, you can download your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, and just about everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. Thank you guys, as always, for supporting the Swamp the way you do. I couldn't do this on a daily basis without you guys. I'll see you guys soon with another creepy video.